Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. It's kind of our last uh, normal Dividend Cafe video and podcast we'll do uh, until the week after Thanksgiving. I do want to come to you next week with a uh, short Dividend Cafe on our Thanksgiving reflections. But from a market standpoint, there's quite a bit to, to talk about this week. What I won't be talking about is the, the updates with the reconciliation bill that the House voted on. Uh, this morning and past, uh, obviously, it's not really much of a story because now is where the fun really starts going to the Senate, which is where we've known most of those conflicts are. Um, markets itself, there's not a whole lot to say kind of about this week. Uh, I think that the big things that are on most people's minds that are actual students of the economy and, and are mostly curious about where things go from here are all in the same vein about inflation, about the price level, about the supply constraints in the economy, about labor, about Fed policy, the, the, and all these things sort of intersect to some degree. Um, and that's really the subject of this week's Dividend Cafe. Um, I think that there are short-term and longer-term issues that I would hope people who regularly listen to or watch or, or especially read the Dividend Cafe know how I feel about that um, longer term, there is absolutely no question that the great things that occupy my mind and how I steward capital for my clients center around the excessive indebtedness in the society and its ramifications to long-term growth and the policy prescriptions to deal with that constrained growth, uh, both fiscal policy and monetary policy that I think invite further complications, including sometimes exacerbating the low growth problem that they're intended to address. So you have this negative feedback loop that has become kind of the story of global economics and how one gets return on investment and return on capital in a period of, of growing stagnation in the economy is a very complicated thing and one that I'm incredibly committed to as a long-term fiduciary advisor of clients. Uh, in the shorter term right now, I think that there are more people focused understandably on what they see right in front of them, which is tremendous uh, disruptions in our supply chain, uh, tremendous shortages of necessary laborers to help increase the level of supply needed to meet current levels of demand and, and uh, the escalating prices that come with that conundrum. And so both things are true at once. That In the shorter term, there are supply-induced upward price pressures that are very real and relevant to the economic actors. And longer term, there is a, a fear of stagnation that um, is very concerning to me. When we talk about the transitory nature of price increases, there's a couple things I want to say, and I want to start with energy. Um, because I think that that is a different story than what is happening with some of the other aspects of growing uh, prices, particularly in raw materials and other commodity prices. Um, look, allegedly people would say we had like negative $40 oil at one point during the COVID pandemic. I've already explained over the you know months and that followed that that, that was a bit of a misstatement. Uh, that had to do with, at the time, futures contracts expiring and there not being a place to store oil. And so people were actually having to pay uh, to get rid of oil. So it, it, it prints as if it's a negative price, but it had to do with basically storage costs. But regardless, oil prices very sustainably collapsed behind uh, a total erosion of demand that took place during the COVID lockdowns. And, and now here we are um, a year and a half later with WTI crude somewhere around $80 and natural gas somewhere around 5 to $6. And so both prices are substantially lower than they were um, in the early part of last decade. And both prices are significantly higher than they were at their low points of, of a year ago. And even their kind of five-year average, you know, they've been sitting more somewhere around 50 to 60, not 75 to 85. I think that there is very little that's going to prove transitory 
about oil and gas prices um, for a number of reasons. I don't know that we're going to see over $100 oil. I, I think that if we did, it would be immediately remedied by the political emergency of the moment. Uh, but I don't think that we're going to go sustainably lower than 70. Uh, you know, the, you could get to back to the 50s for a period of time. But really, the only thing I see that could bring that supply and demand into a price equilibrium that resulted in a $50 oil price anytime soon is a recession, is some demand shock that was so severe that it didn't bring supply levels up to meet equilibrium. It just brought demand down so substantially. But right now, with the normalized demand that we're seeing, not just in a demand recovery, a pent-up demand uh, spike post-COVID, I think that what we're seeing is an undersupply that is a result of some political factors and a result of economic decision-making when prices were so low, that there is a lag in our ability to get production prices higher. And I just do not believe there's an easy way around that. And in the meantime, capital allocation has not exactly helped the cause because of this huge movement for decarbonization. Some people could be very for the idea environmentally, other people could be against it. But out of the various decarbon um, pressures, you had a reallocation of capital that has resulted in underinvestment into increasing supply. And if demand is going to stay level or grow and prices are where they are, to get prices into a lower and more favorable equilibrium with demand would require higher supply. And that's just simply not in the cards right now from a political standpoint, from a um, public sentiment standpoint, let alone from a capital allocation standpoint. So I don't think you want another COVID lockdown or global recession uh, that's not the way to create lower prices, but that's the only thing I think creates lower prices on the energy front. But then you look to other parts of the economy, and I think it's a different story. The labor shortages that exist, um, I believe, are very problematic. Uh, and, and yet, I'm not sure that there's an easy solution. Is it three weeks? Is it six months? I really don't know. I do know, as I've written about before, that there's a heavy concentration of decreased labor force participation for those 19 to 26 years old and those 55 years old and older. And so you have entry level people that are less uh, zealous to enter the workforce and you have um, older people, not necessarily of retirement age, maybe of retirement means that, but either way that if they have brought their services off the table in terms of economic use, it has profound ramifications. Um, you know, I do understand, I'm not immune to it either, that different people's political leanings are likely to inform how they view this subject, that some would be um, prone to want to use the extended federal unemployment uh, uh, and their criticism of that policy, which, by the way, is a criticism I freely admit I have as an explanation for the entire issue. Um, the ongoing amount of government payments that, that took place from the past administration into the new administration throughout the COVID moment. Um, I think right now there is an increasing amount of discussion around whether or not vaccine mandates from certain employers are, are contributing to the problem. And I would imagine that the way someone feels about that subject might inform the level of intensity they want to ascribe to its role in the labor shortages uh, the fact of the matter is all these things are somewhat unknowable, so I try to avoid it. I don't lean away from my own political leanings or socioeconomic uh, beliefs, but ascribing uh, cause and effect to those things when I can't prove it, I avoid as much as I possibly can as an objective uh, person. Um, I happen to be very, very, very for the vaccine and very, very against vaccine mandates, and yet the, the role in which vaccine mandates may or may not be exacerbating um, a diminished interest in the workforce, I simply have no way to measure. Prima facie, part of it makes sense to me to some degree, but is it 1%, is it 10%? I just don't know. So my point is, regardless of various opinions on aspects of these social uh, components and political components that are contributing economically, what I do know is it's somewhat immeasurable. 
And anything that can't be proven to be true or proven to be false is kind of unhelpful. I do think that the labor shortage um, is an extremely complicated subject. It is very much behind a lot of the supply disruptions. And yet a lot of the things that we say we want to do or could do or should do, we could do tomorrow. And we're not going to get 80,000 truck drivers, uh, 80,000 new truck drivers ready to start driving uh, supply and goods around this country. Um, there is a lag that's going to exist before we find equilibrium. Now, one of the things I want to bring up here is that there's a leverage that laborers have because of the labor shortage that many believe, totally understandably, is going to put downward pressure on profit margins because increased cost of wages is an input that uh, would, would drive a diminished level of profitability. And the only thing I can say about it is that I pretty much agree in theory, but I'm not so sure about the stickiness of that. Um, there's a wild card now that's a bit different than um, past situations uh, where you have greater digital options, greater technological options, there's greater automation. And I think that um, the extent to which employers solve for higher labor cost and lower labor supply with non labor solutions is something we don't know the answer to. I don't imagine any of it can happen very quickly, um, but I do think that higher wages are not always necessarily profit suffocating. Higher wages can be a very good thing when they're coming with higher revenue generation, higher productivity, but where higher wages are coming because of a labor shortage that is pushing that input price higher than it otherwise would be, uh, I accept the argument it could cut into profitability and um, growing productivity is the only solution and the only way to grow productivity is on the supply side and I don't know that uh, people are necessarily going to like how that how that turns up. Um, you have to remember that getting the supply side higher is a little Pollyannish no matter how many times I say it and how, and how much I believe it we have gone uh, almost two years, not quite. It's over 18 months and less than 24 months where I think there's been very, very little investment into new factories and new oil wells and, and new R&D and the things that would help right now if they, if they could hit a switch and say, let's get going, we need more supply. I think that through the COVID moment, there was not exactly the right incentive or capacity for increasing production and therefore seeing it now ramp up is going to take some time. Um, those that would advocate for the Fed to come in and solve things as a monetary solution, I think have to understand, I have been, I, I got to figure it's 20 editions of Dividend Cafe this year that were devoted to my criticisms of certain aspects of Fed policy, including quantitative easing and certain distortions I think they create in the marketplace that make things uh, challenging for investors. And yet, even as a critic of QE, I would objectively say that if they stopped all QE tomorrow, no tapering, they just cut cold turkey, I don't think that it would do one iota of good for getting 80,000 new truck drivers into the marketplace. And so, um, you know, the, the Fed's role is different than a lot of people understand right now. And that's not me saying that the Fed's doing nothing wrong. I do believe, as an advocate of the notion of trade-offs and, and the reality that there is no free lunch, I think that there is um, uh, a trade-off in Fed policy that is a difficult thing to swallow. Very bad result for savers who are living off of very low interest rates. Very bad result for uh, banks that have a really flat yield curve. Um, however, the challenge of greater um, money supply has not proven to be the cause of this particular problem we face. It's invited other problems. 
And, and when those say, well, the long-term bond rates are quite low because of Fed activity, I do think we have to remember that the Fed owns less than 20% of the bond market. And that that is very different than Japan's bond market where they own over 60% and that they represent 100% of new issuance. We have gone through this before three times, QE1, QE2, QE3, where our Fed had been buying a lot of bonds and stopped. And all three times, bond yields did not go higher. They actually went lower. But even if they don't go lower this time, uh, there is right now 80% of the bond market with full price discovery that could very well go out and be pushing yields higher. Uh, the Fed's buying $80 billion a month of treasuries. It's, it's peanuts compared to the total size of the treasury bond market which is many tens of trillions of dollars. And should people be demanding higher rates because of their inflation expectations, they could get those if they went and wanted to go into market and bid the price of those bonds down and those yields up. But uh, from QE1 through QE3 and the way the bond market itself is behaving now, we're not seeing any of that. I think all of that reinforces that these price escalation concerns we face now are, are very much related to supply challenges and labor shortages that uh, require um, a solution. And I believe we'll get a solution, but that is in a sort of TBD uh, uh, timing framework. Um, I wrote last week about the algebraic formula, uh, this, this money times velocity, the money supply times velocity. Um, being one side of the equation and then the prices equaling uh, that money times velocity when they're multiplied by the total supply of goods in the economy. And so my view is that prices have gone higher as uh, supply has gone lower to stay in equilibrium to, to money in that quantity theory of money equation. If I've lost you, it's okay. You could read last week, so it's not important right now. The thing I want to get to is I would love to say that one of the upsides of this period of escalating prices we're living through out of this labor shortage and supply disruption is that uh, it will offset some of those disinflationary pressures or, or economic stagnation pressures that I refer to as Japanification. But fundamentally, the incredibly low velocity of money that we experience right now has not changed. And so... Uh, if we do end up getting the supply level back up, I think that that brings prices into equilibrium, but it won't do anything for the fact that um, our money supply is being multiplied against a continually collapsing level of velocity. Why is that velocity of money declining? Again, in my mind, it is the excessive indebtedness that puts uh, future growth into the present and represents a significant headwind to economic opportunity. And this is kind of, I think, the, un the, the underlying thing that we're dealing with right now is confidence in the future. People um, do not want to save money for future when they don't have confidence in the future. Savings is the predicate to investing. You cannot invest a dollar that you didn't first save. This is such an important economic law, such a basic economic statement of fact. Investment first comes from savings. Savings into investment, investment into productivity. One who has optimism for productive growth into the future is more prone to invest, which makes them more prone to save. People are less prone to save when they have less confidence into the future. That is the issue that we deal with that creates a lower velocity, that creates um, less business investment, and ultimately serves as a stagnation-inducing force in the economy, is that lost confidence that comes from the dynamic of uh, future growth being suppressed by, by excessive indebtedness. These are the long-term issues that we're dealing with. And the shorter term issues continue to be the supply constraints. And, and when someone says, well, you can call it short term, but I don't think it's three weeks. I think it's three years. Someone else says, yeah, I don't think it's three weeks either. I think it could be six months. 
everyone's speculating, turning a knob here, a knob there, and nobody knows, and that includes me, includes you. Uh, I do think it's not going to be three weeks, and I also do think it's not going to be three years, but beyond that, you know, that's not very helpful. So where does that leave us now? Um, tremendously important in a period of time that's trying to find its way around productivity that will not be distracted by shiny objects. The shiny objects are things that are invested in for no other purpose than this sort of economic belief uh, that the price will be higher, uh, that is not tethered to um, an internal rate of return, to, to a uh, activity, something that enhances quality of life, something that is a pure financialization that I invest in it because I believe that someone else will pay more for it. And that can go on for a long period of time. But in a period of time where we are attempting to solve for a productivity challenge, it is incredibly important to me that people avoid what could properly be defined as bubble-like behavior, Ponzi-like behavior, things that extract their economic or investment opportunity from nothing other than the belief that others will find it to be so. And rather find economic investment opportunity in things that deliver an intrinsic value, that deliver an internal rate of return, that represent goods and services and knowledge and ideas that are embedded in, in the economy and human activity and building um, profit growth and, and enhancing quality of life. So that makes me very skeptical about speculative um, uh, shiny objects, if you will, that are more faddish in nature, more tulip oriented for those who have studied the history of manias. And it makes me much more fond right now, even more fond than I've been of uh, production oriented parts of the economy, the industrial sector, the material sector, the energy sector, there are companies in there that I think might warrant higher weighting when you consider society's growing need for what they're doing. And so the investment applications are being even more skeptical through a period of more temptation um, about uh, what could be described as bubbles, Ponzi-like speculation, and instead be more focused and in, even indeed increasing weighting to those things that will have to serve as the engines of a supply side solution to our current economic travails. I hope this is all helpful. There is a, uh, a, a chart in divinitycafe.com I want you to look at. And then the quote of the week is one of my favorite quotes that I've ever put in divinitycafe.com. And I'll leave you in suspense to try to drive you to look at that. Um, thank you for listening to this podcast. Thank you for watching this video. I'll come back with some Thanksgiving reflections. Um, before Thanksgiving Day of next week, and then we'll be back on track with a full Dividend Cafe um, in the beginning of December at the end of that week after Thanksgiving. But reach out to us with any questions you have in the meantime. There's a lot of complexity in these subjects. You've pro probably had to put up with a little more jargon than I normally like to have, but I do hope I'm helping to give some perspective on what is a complicated world and a complicated economy, and nevertheless, um, uh, a set of economic challenges and opportunities that are very important for investors. We're going to continue working to that end. We thank you for watching and listening to The Dividend Cafe. Have a wonderful weekend. Fight on.